I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From hence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. The Lord Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone their sins, they are forgiven them. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. We are um, at a section in our uh, family altar, part of the bulletin. We go through the um, we go through the catechism once a year, and we endeavor to do that at home. We're on a new part on holy baptism. Can you guys say holy baptism? Holy, holy baptism. baptism. Yeah. And um, one of the things I want to talk to you about is what is what what is baptism. Okay, and uh, baptism is um, up here, guys. Just just look up here. All right, the words you just spoke. Could you say them with me? Go and make disciples of what? All nations. Right. So hold on. Baptizing them in the what? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So very briefly here today, um, baptize means to apply water. Can you say apply water? Apply water. So Jesus says, apply water while you speak the words, what? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus told us to baptize. He told, why do we baptize? Be, because um, somebody made it up or because Jesus told us to do it? Jesus told us to do it. He gave us the command and he told us how to do it as well. Apply water in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, okay? Um, so we use water and we apply that water in the triune name, right? All right. Now, uh, when I say apply water, um, in some churches we have sprinkling, a little bit of sprinkle of water. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we administer baptism by uh, pouring. Can you say pouring? Yeah, I have like a little shell. Have you ever seen me do that before? I have a little shell, and what do I do? I say, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, pouring or applying that water three times in the name of the Holy Trinity. So sometimes it's sprinkling, sometimes it's pouring. Um, you know, there's other ways to baptize too. Um, in some churches, there's a full immersion. Uh, can you say full immersion? Full immersion. Frederick, do you, you know what that word means, full immersion? Any, have you ever seen a full immersion before? Um, maybe some of you have. We had a church when we lived in Wisconsin that was right down the street from us. And every once in a while, we saw the whole church walking past our house, going to a, a pool nearby, and there were some people to be baptized and they baptized um, the person um, instead of just pouring or sprinkling, they were baptized like a full dunk. Do you know what it means? Do you ever go swimming and then you say to your uh, brother or sister or your mom or your dad, say, don't dunk me, right? <laughs> or do you try to sometimes dunk your brother or sister? Yeah. Um, or your dad or your mom? Yeah. Um, you know, God likes dunking us too, but his special dunk is where he applies um, the Holy Trinity name, the uh, triune name, the name of, of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He applies it to us. <coughs> Do you know baptism is where your name meets God's name, where you meet the Lord in the waters? We'll talk more about that in the future, but um, I say something like, 
you know, August, uh, Irwin, that was my, my first son's name, or Frederick William Lewis, he has got two names, two middle names. There's a reason behind that. Frederick William Lewis, I baptize you. And uh, so it's Frederick's name and God's name come what? Together. And God writes our name in the book of life. He says that our names are written there. Isn't that kind of neat? That God takes record of you and of your baptism and the day that he, uh, he baptized you um, and you went in those waters too. Mm -hmm. All right. You guys have a good day. Let's close with Luther's uh, morning prayer. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Hey, one last thing here. I see some nice purses up here. Do you know I have a purse too? I carry it on communion calls. So I'll have to show you my purse sometime. All right? <laughs> have a good day, guys. We'll see you. Uh, we're in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. And um, I've decided after studying the chapter that I will, uh, we won't go through the whole thing, even though it's, uh, not a terribly long chapter. Our goal will get to uh, our goal will be to get through verses one through eight. Um, Ecclesiastes twelve one through eight. I feel that this is one of those chapters where you're going to read it and you're going to be like, um, Pastor, need a little help with this one, having a little trouble. But I think you'll be able once you read through it to kind of, oh, I think it's about this. But that when we actually go through it. Um, it's, it's going to be helpful for you to kind of see what, uh, what's happening in this chapter. And um, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, okay? Um, 1 through 8 is the section that we're doing. Um, before we actually read this section, I want you to see a word that... Um, that serves as a helpful marker of the structure of this section. And I want you to see if you can find the word and then find how many times or where you find it. So Ecclesiastes 12, 1 through 8, um, I want you to look for this word uh, right here. Right on the board. It's almost like a gamble when you choose a marker. You never know what you're going to get. Like, um, we play a game. Now, you know how, you know what uh, you know, Forrest Gump said, right? Uh, life is like a what? Yeah, you never know what you're going to get. We have a game that we play in our house called Chocolate Battleship. Um, we used to have a lady in the parish who would give us chocolates every year for Christmas. And, you know, the kids would sometimes, um, you know, they would get a piece of chocolate after dinner and then not like the one that they got, right? So we developed a game called Chocolate Battleship. That basically is that they take a marker, and I mark A, B, C, D, E, F, G, right? Um, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And the children have to, they say like B3. And then it's like hit, hit sunk kind of thing. So if there's a chocolate there, then they get the chocolate, and they have to eat it no matter what it is. Okay? And then as the, uh, as the days go by and there's less chocolates, if, if they guess three times and they don't, get one, it's, it's too bad for them. But uh, um, So um, that had nothing to do with anything. Um, I want you to find out the word before. One through eight here. Um, where are you finding this word before? Now, in your translation, it might be a little bit different. You might see the words... Um, until which time. So this word in the Hebrew, can, you can um, put in there um, also until which time. Um, until which time. You may have a, a, a different, it should be, should be there more than once. Okay. So yeah, I was talking about markers. You never know which one you're going to get, right? Just like chocolate. Um, okay. Um, can someone raise their hand and tell me 
uh, one place where you see it, and then we'll read that verse, and then we'll go to the next place. Anyone help me? Um, please, Deb. The first verse. Okay, the first verse there says, Remember also your Creator in the days of your li- youth. Everyone say it together. Before the evil days come and the years draw near of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. But um, in other words, you could put in there until which time the evil days come. So, okay. First of all, we see that in verse one. Does anybody else see that anywhere else? Okay. Um, I think this is a different Hebrew. It's possible. Yeah. Verse two. Uh, before, yeah, you're right. Uh, verse 2 here. Um, uh, before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars. Until which time? Until the time where the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are dark and the clouds return after the rain. Okay, verse 2. Any other places that you're seeing this? So we have it in verse 1, and then verse 2, and then what? Six. Thank you. And then verse 6. Um, and this is the last time we're going to see it. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I'll read that verse. Before the silver cord is snapped or the golden bowl is broken or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain or the wheel broken at the cistern. So generally speaking, where are we finding this word before? It serves as the structure of the chapter and we find it again in ver- right at the beginning, verse uh, twice at the beginning and then really kind of towards the end as well. So kind of think this, sometimes we call this an, an inclusion um, or a frame. I like the idea of a frame because it reminds us of a picture frame where we have something at the beginning and then something at the end as well. Okay. That's the first point, the structure of this chapter. Now, um, let's. I think it would be helpful if I read this whole thing and then... Again, it's important that you pause and you think about it, and we'll pick it apart as we go through. But I'm going to read 1 through 8, and then we'll go back and discover what it means. Remember also your Creator in the days of your youth, until which time, or before what happens. The evil days come, and the years draw near of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. So, in other words, generally speaking, what do you think this section is going to be about? Okay, it's going to be about aging. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be about aging. And it's also, what's the admonition or the advice? Okay, okay. Remember your creator um, as well. well. We'll get to that. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return after the rain. In the day when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men are bent and the grinders cease because they are few, and those who look through the window are dimmed, and the doors on the she- street are shut uh, when the sound of the grinding is low, and one rises up at the sound of a bird, and all the daughters of song are brought low. They are afraid also what is high, and terrors are in the way. The almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper drags itself along, and desire fa- fails because man is going to his eternal home, and the mourners go about the streets. Before the silver cord is snapped, or the golden bowl is broken, or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern, and the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. Now, there's a lot in here about aging, and once I explain it, you're going to be shaking your head like, oh yeah, ain't that the truth, okay? So um, some of the things you probably didn't get, but once they're unpacked in this beautiful poem of a- about aging, you're going to really say, wow, this is... This is insightful, this is interesting, and also, what do I get from it? Okay, so we'll take it apart. Um, okay, in, the, in this word in the Hebrew here, young man, I think it's helpful to understand uh, when it gives advice in verse 1 about the young man. Um, this is uh, referring to a man in the prime, um, prime of, of his life, um, prime of strength. Um, but it's also in the Hebrew referring to specifically a person who, uh, just before marriage, okay? That's the kind of the time period, period of what this is saying right here. Just before a marriage, just before we might say, you know, uh, life, life, um, life begins uh, in marriage, um, prime, prime of his life. 
That's what it means, the young man. And you had said it earlier um, about um, the word remember, remember also your creator. Um, looking back to verse 11, 9, um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stumble a little while until I get to the essence of this because I'm struggling with it too. But, but let's help me out here. Um, looking back to 11, 9, recognizing that some of this talk to youth happened there, uh, what, it, what advice is given to the young man or youth? So you, you gave me a little already, but kind of see if we can't just flesh it out a bit. What, what basic ideas are going on here where it says, remember also your creator um, in the days of your youth? If you go back again to the previous chapter, that verse I mentioned, um, verse 11-9, uh, what kind of what, what kind of, what are we kind of to think about um, the admonition is any anything? It's your carefree days. You didn't have a lot of worries. You didn't have a lot of responsibilities. You know, the youth at that time, you could just <clears throat> go do what you want. It doesn't really matter because you're not accountable to anybody yet. But what is it saying about that? Enjoy it. Everybody. Okay. Okay. All right. So if we create a list here, which we're going to do on this side, and you're not experiencing some of the things in the list, you should be what? Thankful and happy and recognize what? You still have life and you still have some of these things in the list. I think that's one admonition here that um, um, there is a benefit of young age, but this is also about um, where we're all headed. And this is the final chapter. We're all headed ultimately um, to the grave. Um, and increasingly, as we get to the grave, life gets more challenging. Okay, anyone? Um, how about the, please, uh, Barb? I hear the other thing. You said, remember your creator. You're not, you're not ready for the next part. You know, you're starting to remember your job. Remembering God. Thank you. Okay, remembering. I'm just repeating it because the people up here can't always hear. Um, remembering God, remembering your creator. Not waiting till the end of your life. But, but, but uh, making God a part of your life from your youth on. So we had that admonition, enjoy life, but remember you will be judged for these things, so everything in, within reason. But don't forget your creator. Remember your creator. And, and yeah, yeah, yeah. And in the Bible, remembering is more than, again, I've said this before, more than just thinking, just like when your wife says, do you remember the milk at the grocery store? You can't say when you came home, well, I thought about it, right? <laughs> it means actually to get it. It means an active, an, an active thinking. So our life is about remembering um, creator. Any other remember words in the Bible that we can think about? Jesus said, what, do this in you know, remembrance of me. Um, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Uh, the thief on the cross. Uh, remember me when you come into your kingdom. But what word is specifically spoken of when we think of the word creator? Um, I guess, remember, your cre God is described here, you know, as our creator. So when we think of creator, and at least Martin Luther does this a lot, and I think this is helpful. When we think about our creator, we think about our physical life or about our spiritual life. What would you say? I mean, it's both. It's both. But it, our crea creator is a lot of it has to do with our what? our body and our life, our physical life here. So I would say that a majority of this, it's not to discount that the God who creates us is the God who redeems us, but I do think that this chapter, the heavy emphasis um, is at least primarily on the God who creates us, who gives us our bodies, who gives us our life, who didn't make us for death, that death is a foreign intrusion, intrusion in a fallen world. Okay, I think that's good. Um, according to verse 1, what is coming? What can we expect about the future? Trouble. Days of trouble. Okay, evil days or days of trouble? And what? Okay, evil days? And days of trouble? What, what about the second part? It's kind of like evil days, days of trouble. And we're not going to enjoy life much any longer. Yeah. You know... We, have, we play these songs, don't worry, be happy kind of thing. But the Bible has a great dose of reality that the days are coming where what? You don't have to feel bad about it. It's just that 
the pleasure that was once experienced will not be experienced because of this life of sin. I think there's, some free, uh, there's something freeing about that, that if you're waking up and you're saying, it's kind of a gloomy day yet again, this chapter will get to that, then the Lord is simply saying what? It's the way it's going to be, folks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, a few, few comments here. What can't the young man possibly conceive? What it's like be, to be old. What it's like to be old. Well, anything else? It's going to be hard to stand up if you sit down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. How could that be? The young man has to be... A young, why, can't, why can't the young man conceive of this? Because a young man says what? I can... I'm indestructible. I am indestructible. I can do anything. So wisdom is listening to your elders to simply say, guess what, folks? It's going to get a little bit more challenging, okay? What does years mean? Um, what does it mean here? Before the evil days come and the years draw near, of which you will say I have no pleasure. What does the word years imply? Aging. It implies in aging, but um, this process of days without pleasure implies what? Not just one, not just two, but what? Years. Years. Sometimes the year, you're going to have years where... There will be no pleasure. Thank you. Um, the rest of the section is the explanation here. Um, um, now, before we get to the explanation, I would like to suggest to you that this applies, yes, to the failing strength of each individual as we face it, but also we can apply to the coming day of judgment. Some of the things here we can apply to the coming day of judgment. Um, as well. So I want you to think about the fact as you're going through this that, okay, you know, how the, you know how the judgment day is coming, right? Every person's slow demise is like a mini apocalypse. It's not like you say, well, I died before the last day. It's a good thing. It's that all, all it's often that your life and your dying is a mini day of judgment, right? Many of the things that are experienced in the final day are fast forwarded into your life as you wait also for the return of the Lord to call you home. Does that make sense? You have a day of judgment as well um, where you face the coming. So there's a picture of both. And I'd like to apply this also to the reality that all good things come to an end. And I mean like, you know, things like um, R.J., you know, Merv Zimmerman's plumbing, um, you know, plumbing might not be around forever. And sometimes when institutions like that, I'm not saying that they're closing or anything, please don't. <laughs> I'm just giving an illustration of or, or a church closes or we have in our life those times in which wonderful institutions come to an end. And, and that's a time of sorrow but ultimately, the Lord is saying here, there's nothing under the sun that isn't going to, at some point in time, what? End. End and close the doors. <laughs> Whether it's this congregation, it has a lifespan. Whether it is our, our own lives, whether it's the schools we go to, whatever it is. Whether our political institutions. There's a reality. We think we can perpetuate things into perpetuity. Say that five times fast. <laughs> um, but yet, we have to recognize that everything has a what? Expiration date. And there's some, there's some value in recognizing that what? It's going to come to an end. And it, though sad and difficult, um, what do we make of it? And we'll get to that. Maybe some thoughts about what we make to it. Okay, uh, verse 2. Um, how does this apply to the end of the world? I think this verse particularly applies well to the end of the world. I'm going to read verse 2. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return after the rain. How many things are mentioned um, um, taking place um, as time goes on here or what we can expect? <coughs> how, many, how, many, how many things are mentioned, though, just in this chapter, in this verse, sorry? Sun, moon, stars, and then we have that curious thing, the clouds return after the rain, which is a beautiful poetic turn of phrase. But how does this apply to the end of the age? What does the Lord say? There's going to come a time in which what? The sun's going to stop its light. The stars are going to fall. 
right? The moon's going to turn to blood before the coming of the great day of the Lord. The world is going to what? Stop. Stop. If you would apply this to your personal life, what might this be? Repli- uh, um, okay. Um, yes? Losing your sight. Thank you. Uh, losing your sight specifically, your eyes getting dim um, and you not being able to see. Um, who was the guy who said um, he was a German? We had an institute, had a big institute over there. He died maybe in the last hundred years. Famous person, forgetting his name. Is, is, is close to that. Um, his, some of his last words, oh, Goethe, Goethe, G-O-E-T-H. I don't know much about him except his last words were more light. <laughs> Fascinating. More light. Huh. Was he asking for more light or was he seeing more light? We're still asking the question. <laughs> you know, our, um, the Bible says of Abraham, his eyes grew what? dim. I didn't know that until I got, you know, I'm getting older. And the ladies on, you know, uh, Monday, Thursday, when the pastor dimmed the lights down, pastor, I can't see the bulletin. I was like, I see it just fine. (laughs) All right. Okay. um, We understand our elders a whole lot better as we approach that age. Yeah. I know I think of my mom and how she never wanted to leave her home toward the end. And I understand now why she didn't want to go anywhere. It was easier to be at home, more comfortable. And so. Yeah, yeah, we'll get to two. Uh, let's jump ahead to what you're saying in verse uh, 5. They are afraid of what is high and terrors on the way. Uh, fear of what? F- afraid of what is high. What does that mean? Fear of heights? And, well, yeah, not just ladders. Fear of falling. Yeah, you live, you live as you get older with a fear of one fall. And imagine what it was like. We have handicapped accessibility, but what was it like in the day that this was written? In stony uh, Palestine, you would always have to think that your, your last fall, the statistic is something like if you fall and break your hip after 80, what's the percentage of people that make it through? Do you know? 50%. I, that was a higher statistic than I had thought. Yeah, and I was quoted that statistic by a doctor. But, okay. So, um, the, um, the idea is it's easier just to do what? Stay at home. You, ha- you go out and you have a fear. You're going to fall, whatever it may be. Um, yeah. Okay, now, um, verse... What does the cl- verse two? What do the clouds return after the rain return f- refer to? That's beautiful. What is it? It's it's a beautiful turn of phrase, but it's not beautiful. What's the, what usually happens after the clouds come and new world? But as age go on, Nick. But. So as, as we age, one of the challenges is that, you know, you get that problem with your arm worked out and then the other arm starts hurting. And you get proud, you know, so it's just one doctor's appointment after the other dealing with uh, one thing after, after the other. So the maladies, you think to yourself, I'm going to solve this problem and then I'll be better. But then after that problem comes what? Another problem. And this is the Lord's words here. This isn't my words. This is what the Lord is saying here. All right. Um, now, let's go on here. Um, verse three. In the day when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men are bent and the grinders cease because they are few and those who look through the windows are dimmed. This is good poetry. In the days when the keepers of the house tremble, what kind of house would this be ref- re- uh, referring to if it was a house with guards? Okay, first of all, if we, uh, if we referred this to more of a, a communal image, it would be a castle with guards. Why would guards at an important castle tremble? Only because what was coming, they were what? They were not prepared for or scared of. So what this deals with is they are about to face an enemy of which no particular thing that they have on their sword or belt is going to what? 
is going to stop it, okay? So you can't what? You can't stop the encroach of this particular thing. If we deal with more of the body here, what would be the keepers of the house? Our, thank you, our hands, our arms. And at the end of our lives, what happens? We can't, we, we tremble. How about the strong men are bent? When you think about the strong men, the young men who are, grow older, you know, in the nursing home, you've got these men who were strong in their youth and now they're bent over. But if we refer to the body, what are the strong men? What's the strongest part of our body? Strongest muscles of a body are our, our legs. The strong men are bent um, and the grinders cease. How about this one? Because they are few. The idea is, in other words, you lose your teeth and you can't what? Chew anymore. If we think about the city, this is women. It's referring to women um, uh, who are grinding grain. And pretty soon there's not any more women to grind grain anymore. And so uh, they cease their activities. No more workers to do the job. If we think of a communal image, we think of our day and age where we're lamenting the fact of no one to work, no one to do the labor. Um, that's communal. But as we think about our lives, one of the things is we lose our teeth. Um, and those who look through the windows are dimmed. This is a little challenging. People go in different places with this. One possibility, it will think about, about the windows. Um, the windows, you know, we could think about our eyes dimmed. Um, but in this case, it seems that we're talking on the teeth image as well. That the windows are the what? The windows of the mouth are dimmed. And what does that mean? Not only do our teeth fall out, but they don't sparkle as much as they did when we were, right? Okay. So this is talking about some of the challenges of old age. All right. And the doors on the street, everybody's thinking like, are my teeth is shiny? You know, it's just, <laughs> I apologize. Don't go around like this now, right? Uh, it, it's a part of this life, right? Um, the goal isn't not to make your teeth sparkle more. That's not what the Lord is saying. Maybe you should use crest. <laughs> no, uh, the Lord is saying what? The end is coming. And that sign in the mirror is a sign that what? Um, yeah, the, the ages, the, the, the days are coming. Okay. Um, and the doors of the street are shut. Verse uh, four, and the doors of the street are shut. In this case, this is likely dealing in this passage here. Well, let's go back to the previous one. I just want to say this real quick. In verse 3, how many of the analogies dealt with lower class life and how many dealt with upper class life? I guess my point is as you skim through the four there, you're noticing that some are rich person's analogies. Like, you know, only rich people have, um, you know, uh, guards outside their home. Um, women looking through the windows, kind of a wealthy woman, but you also have the grinders. And so the point here is that with this poetic imagery is, is it happens both what no, no amount of money can what? The rich and poor. Yeah. To the rich and the poor. It, it's not going to escape. Okay. That next verse, the doors of the street are shut are referring to our ears. Yeah. If you think of your ear kind of as a door, this is talking about the advance of our hearing problems. When the sound of the grinding is low, this is beautiful. The sound of the, you can't hear, but one lone bird wakes you up at night. Okay. One of the other challenges of, of old age is that you can't, what? Something strange wakes you up. You can't hear, but at the same time you hear something and then you can't, what? Sleep. All the daughters of song are brought low. What that might mean also is, is that, um, you know, you go to a concert, whatever it might be, um, so, uh, those who sing, those who provide mirth, those who provide laughter, you can't hear them anymore. And so your life, because you can't hear anymore, joy is what? Diminished. Um, uh, there was one of the analogies here, uh, the doors of the street are shut. This was beautiful. It's so deep. I remember in my previous congregation, and you've seen this before with certain individuals where they're hearing the doors of the street are shut. In other words, hearing loss results, resort, results in a person, what? With, withdrawing. They can't hear anymore. And it seems also sometimes to affect their cognition after a while. 
and pretty soon they're totally away from society and they're just coming to church and they're sitting there, but they don't talk to anyone. They're, they, they become separated from, from life. Yeah, okay. Um, excellent. Uh, uh, we de dealt with verse 5. Uh, they are afraid of what is high um, and terrors are in the way. You know, we think to ourselves, what? You know, it's just a walk. And when you're young, it's just a walk. But, you know, when you're old, you think to yourself, what? One misstep, and that's going to be it for me, right? Um, for my father, he was doing his exercises in the home because it was a cold day. He fell and broke his hip, and that was the time the Lord called him home. So little did he know that last circle he made would be his what? His, his last, okay? Um, the last time he would stand. Um, Verse 5, they are afraid also what is high tears along the way. The almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper drags itself along. Two images there. The almond tree, when it blossomed, would first have beautiful, colorful pink blossoms, would soon change to white, and then the blossoms would fall. Yeah. Um, and then after that, uh, the grasshopper drags, drags itself along in ancient culture. God saw the people as grasshoppers. Kind of a, uh, the, the idea is that we're, 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 we're nothing. Of course, we're not nothing before the Lord. But, you know, that in the scope of things, we're just like grasshoppers. Today, here, gone tomorrow. But these types of grasshoppers, these were a non-flying variety. And they kind of walked rather stiffly, almost like they were carrying a burden, but they weren't. Okay. <coughs> stiff you know you know you look at an older person as they age and it would be almost as if they're carrying a backpack with what 50 60 70 80 pounds and there's nothing on them why because that's uh, how old age uh, what happens at old age um, poor translation verse 4 does anybody have a different translation of verse 4 that does not say and desire fails help me out here sorry not verse 4 verse Verse five, uh, five, and desire fails. Anybody have a different translation? Help me out. Desire no longer is stirred. Okay, that's closer. The actual translation here in uh, verse 4 is, let me, let me get to it real quick. Um, it's, uh, go ahead. It's verse 5. Yeah, uh, it is verse 5. Thank you. Say it louder. I don't know what it means, but the, the caperberry bush will produce fruit. Okay, that's the closest yet. The caperberry bush will, will fail to produce its fruit. Um, the caperberry is ineffective. Any ideas for what the caperberry was used for? Aphrodisiac, of course. Um, and so this implies that the joy of intimacy fails. No amount of caperberries is going to do anything anymore, okay? <laughs> and you think nothing is new under the sun. <laughs> it's beautiful, right? The joys of youth are what? Not interesting anymore, right? Beautiful. We have pills for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had that here, but I crossed it off, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, Yes, they're afraid, oh, okay, desire fails because man is going to his eternal home and the mourners go about the streets. Does destruction come to everybody at once, yes or no? No. Um, I like this idea, people walk to their eternal home or people go to their eternal home um, is the idea that in our lives, where are we walking? We're walking to the grave. Every step is one step closer to the grave. And then verse 6, before the silver cord is snapped or the golden bowl is broken or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain or the wheel broken at the cistern. How many analogies are here? Four analogies. These are beautiful. This is unbelievable poetry here. Uh, the first two refer to light. Silver cord refers to a candle and the light snapped. When I say, when you say really, recognize that some of these analogies are difficult for commentators and some will go in different directions. But I think this is the best one I found. 
um, because all in the golden bowl as well as referring to the lamp um, that fuels the light. The idea is that your lamp is what? The light goes away, right? The, the, the candle is snapped, referring all four, referring to the, at, the event of what? Of death. Until this happens, right? How about this, the last two, or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern. Our bodies are, are pictured here as, a, as a containers, as it were. Containers for water. You know, like water is, is life here. And the container is what? Broken. It's, it's used up. It it's no longer can contain um, its life. The golden, uh, the pitcher shattered at the fountain. The water rushes down, brush, breaks the fo- uh, fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern. You know, get the idea of the of the um, the well and uh, bringing that water up, and you've got that rope around the the wooden uh, wheel, and you're bringing that up, and the heaviness of that bucket of water, and it carried it up, you know, hundreds of times before, but all of a sudden now what? It's broken, right? You know, when my father died just uh, three months ago now, I think it's three months, two months, you know, we were having a conversation. Mom was there, and uh, my sister and brother, I've shared the story before. Conversation, one second later, death. Dad, and going to get the nurse. Like she says, he's coding, you know, just head turned to the right, and the picture is broken, right? The. Um, silver um, cord is snapped. Verse 7, in the dust, what? What happens to our mortal bodies? And the dust returns to the earth, what? As it was, right? Dust to dust, ashes to ashes, right? Um, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. What are we made of? Dust and dust that's been enlivened by what? The Spirit. Okay. Um, And what did God say in Genesis 3 we would become? You're hearing it over here with Eloise. The Lord said, because of sin, dust you are, and to what? Dust you shall return. Yet what did God give dust such as ours? He breathed into our nostrils the breath of what? The Spirit, the breath of life. We became living beings. Yet what happens in the end? Our spirit goes to be with God. Now, this isn't the full story. This isn't the only story, but this is the story that we hear in this particular chapter. How did the book begin in verse, first of all, someone read verse 8, please. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Everything is meaningless. And uh, if you would summarize uh, how the book began in 1 verse 2, what would you say? We have, a fra- we have another frame here. This is really, there's a prologue, but this is really the conclusion of the book here at the end. And when we think of meaningless, remember that this word hebel or able has different fields of meaning. And in many ways, I think in this section, it should be translated as able, able, everything's able. In other words, vapor, vapor, or mist or fleeting. That in the end, our lives, we exist. And then very quickly, what? Like 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 a vapor. Like a mist, we are, as the Bible says, what? No, no more. Yeah, yeah please. Um, in verse 6, it says, remember him before the silver cord is severed and all that. Um, and then down in the end of 7, it says, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Does the spirit return to God before our physical body dies? Um, I would say No. My understanding of the scriptures is that at the point of death is separation. Death is the point. So the death is the very point where body and soul or body and spirit are separated. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it ends with this. One or two concluding thoughts. And then I have some thoughts for you. Uh, what does this say about our bodies, our lives, even all inst- human institutions and even the church or the congregation? And we're out this yeah. All like a moth, fretting away like a garment. What, what things are mentioned that will happen to the body? Death and the spirit going to be with God. Um, 
uh, again, I mentioned it already, but I'll mention it again. All those things that we listed that are happening as, as age gets older, if you still experience some of the good things of, of, of life as a youth, remember that you're to be thankful even though and use them and recognize life is good and days are still good even as you have you know, some of those abilities. Um, yeah, please. Sometimes I wonder, all the, the older you get, the more pain the nation you get, and you just can't wait for that day that they're gone. Yeah, it's, yeah, right. The Lord is getting us ready also for, for that as yeah, well. Yeah. Glad that we're going. Just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and in some ways in our life, we have a lot of idols. We put our trust in our looks, and then our looks go, right? Or we put our trust in our strength, and then our strength goes. Or we put our you know, trust in whatever it may be. And um, one of our hymns describes it as props. When every earthly prop gives way, on Christ the solid rock I stand all other ground. And I think we in our lives have a lot of props. There are things that we prop ourselves up on. Where I'm a real person, I can stand before the world because what? You know, I'm strong, I'm whatever it might be. And at the end, the Lord has the opportunity, all the things, all of our props that we're propping ourselves up, he just kind of takes away one by one until he says, what do you got left, folks? And what's the only answer to that? Uh, you only have me, you know? I mean, my father's tears at the time of, you know, when I was singing them the old hymns was kind of the, the recognition that what? Which doctor is going to save him from death, Right? Um, what's going to happen to his health in a few days? I mean, how much strength does he have left? You finally get to that point while you're laying on your deathbed and you say what? I have what? I have nothing. I have nothing except for Jesus. Yeah, yeah. So excellent. Um, how does it help us look? How does it help us as individuals? A lot of people say Christians are useless because they're too busy thinking about the future to be, to be productive today, or too busy thinking about the future um, than uh, to be actually of any use today. How is it this actually the opposite that it is the case? How does apocalyptic vision, this is apocalyptic vision, help us as we live our lives? Well, it helps you know what to invest your time in. Okay. You've got a lot of options, and some of them are worthless. Um, some of them are not going to last long. So it, it helps tremendously to have you know, an eye on the future and an eye on eternity um, to know how to prioritize your, your time and energy now. Excellent. You Anything else? Prepare. Say that again? You can prepare other people for it. You can prepare other people for it. Yeah. Yeah, you can prepare. To not despair. Okay. And well, why do you say that? If you think about things that are going on around us and a lot of people wringing their hands. It's, it's really bad. It is bad. Yeah. We've got bad things happening. Right. We know where our hope is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know, a lot of times Jesus would talk about the end times during the last weeks of his life. He's kind of sitting there like, like okay, I'll tell you about the end times, right? And uh, so that when these things happen, you will know that I told you of them, right? Jesus kind of says it like that. Guess what, folks? It's just it's going to be like that. It's just how it is, right? How they treated me is how they will treat you. So don't, don't get too worked up when what? You got to get out the cane or you got to use, you know, whatever it is that you need to use as a, the Lord says, but, you know, the Lord also says that he'll be with you. I mean, this just doesn't contain all of the gospel here, but we do know the gospel itself. Um, what does Jesus' word said? Okay, two last things. Uh, what does, how about Jesus' words that we should repent and become as little children? How does that have something to say to this chapter? And how, do, how does the verse in the Bible that says, outwardly we are wasting away, but inwardly we are being renewed day by day, what does that have to say about human institutions, our life here as we age, and things as well as we go through this life? What would, would Jesus' words about repent, become as children, what, what, what kind of hope does that mean? You never grow old? Yeah, in, inside we can never, yeah, we, we're renewed every day. Yeah, please, Barb. Kids don't think about tomorrow very much. They're yeah. Kind of, they're in the moment. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, yeah. My, my point also is to say that's beautiful. And I want to say simply that with the Lord, every day is a resurrection. Every day, you know, we think of our life as a span of time. But with repentance and faith in Jesus, every day of repentance is a day that we go back to what? We become as little children, you know. Um, John talks to his little children, I say to you, little children. He's talking to the congregation. They're not offended. And he's talking to everybody um, because we are all little children. And in many ways, our death has already come in our baptism. And all we have for us is the future of the resurrection uh, in store. Last thing here before next week, the conclusion. Read me again verse 1. Okay? Read me again. Remember also, young man, your creator. And I think that's where we'll begin. That in all these things we remember what? The God who made us, um, who breathed life into dust such as we are, um, and also... um, you know, has hope for us also uh, in the future. Any final co- comments or thoughts? Anything you want to add? Um, please, RJ, and then Mark Dick. You made back when we were at, uh, going back to uh, 11 9, that it hit me. Per- yeah. I finally made sense of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is mostly about the physical without forgetting that God's going to judge us in the end. But this whole book is not a spiritual, quote unquote, book, it's more about the physical without or forgetting of the spiritual. Yeah. Because I've always struggled with Ecclesiastes. I'm always trying to find the spiritual meaning. Well, there is not. It's talking about the physical. Right. Just remember that God's going to judge in the end. So, well, now when I look back at just some scriptures, it's just like, wow, this yeah. is simple. Yeah. <laughs> so, I don't think it's too complicated. Yeah. That, so you made that comment. I appreciate me, that. Yeah. It really made Ecclesiastes a book to <coughs> understand, not a book to just, like, through as quick as I can. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and uh, it reminds me of the Mackinac Bridge, you know, five miles long. The guy who paints it when he's at the end, right, what does he do? He goes back at the beginning. And that's what the scriptures are for us. You know, we, we get so much and we're like, I got to look at it again, all from a different perspective. And that's the joy of it as well. Dick, thank you. Pastor, we uh, got together Christmas Eve near the end of my Yeah. Yeah, isn't that beautiful? Yeah. And I'll say this as well. Um, For those of you who are fathers, more than anything else, and remember in the Old Testament, what does Abraham and Jacob, what do they always, and Joseph, what do they always do before they die? They bless their children. Your children want a blessing from you. And so you fathers better do it because that's your job. And I know a lot of times you don't want to bless them because half the time they're not worth a blessing. <laughs> but if Eve, if, God, if Adam can look at Eve and say, you're going to be the mother of all living, despite the fact that she ate the forbidden fruit, that they together fell into sin, we bless on the basis of God's word and promise, not on the basis of what we see. Um, and so every child Need, uh, needs a blessing, and your job as fathers, especially fathers, mothers too, but people seek it from their fathers. You need to bless your sons and your daughters as well. Uh, if you, any of you have any teeth left? Can you still chew? Enjoy the day! See? See? Yeah, there's, yeah. Got still some eyes? Life is good. What did I miss? Yeah. It's the eyes that are going Yes. Yep. Yeah. And we even got the little pills too. Yeah, right now. All right. <laughs> the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.